Welcome to Routing and Switching. We are doing Chapter 4, Routing Concepts. So, what is routing? That's going to be a, a key focal point for today. We're going to be talking about routing concepts, the basic configuration of a router, how the router does decisions, basic router operations, and we're going to end with a summary. So our objectives are to configure a route to route between multiple directly connected networks. We're going to describe the primary functions and features of a router, explain how the router uses that information in a packet to make forwarding decisions, explain the encapsulation and decapsulation process used by routers, compare ways in which a router builds a routing table, explain routing tables. This one is going to be more specifically directly to directly connected networks. Lastly, explain how a router builds a routing table of directly connected networks, and explain how a router builds using static routes, and we're going to end with dynamic routes. So let's go with functions of a router. What are some of the characteristics? Some network characteristics is going to be our logical and physical topology, the speed of the network, the cost, cost being the transmission cost, could also be physical cost. Security, availability, scalability, reliability. These are all characteristics of a router on a network. Okay, so what, once we go past those characteristics, why routing? The router's primary responsibility is for routing traffic between networks. A better definition of that is path selection between multiple networks. You can do this several different ways. Here we have an output for a show IP route. This will be done on a router and you will have codes for how the routes are learned. Gateway isn't set and we have two C networks. The C its code is for connected, and so it has two directly connected networks, 192.168.1.0 with a slash 24, 192.168.2.0 with a slash 24. So that means one of these networks is 192.168.1, one of the other networks is 192.168.2. They're learned by having them directly connected to one another. So, routers are just a dumb computer. A router has a processor, has an operating system, has memory and long-term storage. The operating system for a Cisco router is iOS. However, this is not the only Cisco operating system out there. So for memory, RAM, it's volatile. Inside memory, we have the running iOS, the running configuration, the routing and ARP table, and packet buffer. In the ROM, which is non-volatile. We have the boot up instructions, the basic diagnost uh, diagnostics, and a very limited iOS. In the NVRAM, non-volatile RAM, that will be the startup configuration. We can actually change and update the NVRAM a lot easier than we can ROM. Last is our flash memory. This is going to be our more longer term storage. And this is where the iOS is stored and other system files are stored. This is how a router looks. This happened to be a, I want to say a 2941. It's a 2U unit. 2U. It has two 4 gigabyte flash card slots for long term storage. It has several EH Wix, so module cards to add in uh, items. Has an auxiliary port, an RJ45 port. This one also has a mini B USB console port, which those are still very uncommon. And we have two gigabit LAN interfaces and two USB ports. Cisco routers can be different depending on the model and the need. So this is just one example. 
Riders that interconnect networks, we can say that this can interconnect multiple LANs. So our middle is going to be, let's say, the Internet. We have all of our LANs with a gateway that will allow us to transfer our WAN. This is all a large network really is. A collection of multiple LANs that will allow for communication between our LANs. Routers choose best path. Routers use static routes and dynamically learned routing protocols to learn about remote networks and to build their routing tables. Routers use routing tables to figure out best path. That means if I have a packet, how do I get it from me to my destination? The router will choose the best path and how to do that. Routers will encapsulate the packet and forward it to the interface indicated by its routing table. That way if a routing table has multiple pathways, it's going to use the best path that it knows to get the packet from A to B. Here we go. So, if we want to go from 192.168.1 to 192.168.3, the writer has to know, first of all, how to get to 192.168.3. It's not directly connected. R1 knows about 192.168.1 and 192.168.2. Here it is learned through S or static route about 192.168.3 and it says it is connected through serial 0 slash 0 slash 0 which is the same network that 192.168.2.0 is. So what will happen is a packet will come in on R1. It will look at this routing table and it will go, oh I need to go to 192.168.3.0. Send it out serial 0 slash 0 slash 0's interface. So I'll send it out that interface. R2 will get it. And R2 will know, oh, that's for me, and will route accordingly. So different packet forwarding methods. There were several items that used to work. Uh, process switching. It's an older packet forwarding mechanism still available on Cisco routers but it's old. Fast switching is still a very common one and that's a, a common packet forwarding mechanism which uses fast switching cache to store next hop information but that's again kind of old. They're being replaced by the Cisco Express forwarding CEF and this is the most recent and fastest and preferred method for packet forwarding mechanisms. The table entries are not packet triggered like fast switching but change triggered. Want to get further in depth with this? Just not right now. As I wanted to point out that there are different forwarding methods. We're going to go back to our diagram because this can actually be routed several different ways. If we're going from the home office to central office, how do we do it there? Right now, we only have this pathway into the cloud and out. What about going from central to branch? We could be going through a cloud or through the internet service. So there's different pathways. How do we know which pathways to take? Now remember, a gateway. A gateway is a layer 3 device on a network that will allow for outside communication. The default gateway is just the device that will allow that access. So when we're configuring an address for a computer, we are looking for an IP, a subnet, and a default gateway. Graphical representation would be, let's say we are on PC1, and I want to go to our web server. So for our PC1, here's our IP address, here's our MAC address. I would send it out to the router, which is our default gateway. Here's the default gateway address. And the default gateway address 
would have to know it because it's going to be a network outside of our our local network. So router one would get it and would forward it through our WAN to the destination address. The destination address IP address would get it and would, would respond. So let's break down this packet. Here's the data that we're trying to send. Here is the source IP address and the destination IP address. I know it says destination MAC address, but no. This is going to be source and destination IP address. This makes up a packet. Then, for layer 2, we add the destination and source MAC address. You will notice that the source MAC address is the MAC address of PC1. However, the destination MAC address is going to be the MAC address of R1. Because that's going to be the first hop that we have to do, or the first uh, location we have to go to get out of the network. So it will actually do the MAC address of R1. As it gets to R1, it's going to strip off the MAC address. It will send out the new MAC address for the next level. And all the way through to the web server. Because the web server is on the packet. All right, let's go on to documenting the addresses for our network. Here, we have to start getting familiar how to do this because this is how the networks are done. We're going to list the device names, the different interfaces, the addressing for those interfaces, the subnet, and if they have a gateway. So R1, R1 has two interfaces, the FA and the serial interface. So we need to start pointing out what are the uh, addresses, what are the networks, and where do they belong. Things like listing device name, the interface, the address, subnet, and if a default gateway exists. How do we enable an IP on a host? We can do that one of two ways, statically or dynamically. Statically is be manually assigning. Dynamically would be using DHCP. Here is our Cisco router again, except now we're using a Cisco 1941. What do the different links mean? Lights mean? LEDs mean? And that's what this photo kind of divulges. If we are looking at GE00 or GE01, they'll have an S or an L light. Speed versus the link. The link will be if the link is active, on or off. If uh, we're talking the speed, it will blink for a specific time to show you if it's a 10, 100, or 1000 megabits. Same thing with our consoles. It'll either be uh, on or off, green or not green. So how do we get console access to our router? How we do that is through a traditional console cable, which is a DB9, or a serial connection, to an RJ45. That's a normal sky blue console cable. If you do not have a serial cable, you may have to do a serial to USB cable, and then to a serial to DB9. That will connect everything back to that console port. However, newer devices now are using a serial, or they're moving away from serial to this USB to Type B or Mini B serial cable. So USB, the USB B minim, uh, Mini. That because a lot of computers nowadays don't have the serial connections. So they're trying to move away from that. Moving on, how do we set an IP on a switch to be managed? You set it for the appropriate VLAN, and you treat that VLAN like an interface. IP address, give it the IP address, no shutdown, and you may have to give it a gateway so that the switch knows the appropriate gateway address out. 
Let's move on to configuring basic router settings. The big part of that is setting a secret password. Securing management access. Setting the different line consoles or the line VTY to have a password like we've done for our switches. That also includes configuring a banner. Banner is normally set by me, uh, M T O D message of the day M O T D. So it'd be M O T D space special character like a star, then the actual banner, then you end with a star. So M O T D message of the day special character, the message, and you end with the special character. So how do you assign an IPv4 address? You navigate to the interface that you want to set. You could do a description. That's just documentation if you'd like. Assign the appropriate IP address. No shutdown and exit. If we're trying to configure a serial interface, we may have one additional piece of information, which is a clock rate. Because our serial connections require a DCE and a DTE, and so the DCE provides the clock rate. How do we assign an IPv6 address? Same way that we do an IPv6 or a 4 address, except IPv6 is in hexadecimal. So you navigate to the link, IPv6, and you assign the appropriate IPv6 address. Here, however, with IPv4, you'd have to do the subnet, so 255, 255, 255, dot whatever. Here, you can actually use the slash notation. Normally, it will be a slash 64, but you have to be specific within uh, your network design. So the slash number is going to be appropriate for our network. Configuring a loopback. A loopback is a specialized address that allows you to communicate back with yourself. That way you can test connectivity. And when we start getting into certain dynamic protocols like OSPF, it plays an important part. But you just navigate to interface, loopback, and whatever loopback address that you want, or loopback number that you want, and then you assign it an address. That way we can verify end-to-end -end connectivity. How do you verify interface settings? Show IP interface brief, show IP route, show running config. Those are the big three for verifying configuration on an interface. How do you get more detailed information on an interface? Show interface, show IP interface, and that will give you more detailed information. How do you get detailed information for an IPv6 interface? Show IPv6 interface brief. Show IPv6 and then the interface. Show IPv6 route. Those will list the appropriate IPv6 versions for our commands. How to use terminal length. You can pipe in a command and then you could tile it specific items for show IP interface brief you may only want or exclude only the un, uh, unassigned addresses so do not show unassigned addresses so you'd pipe exclude unassigned that would allow you to do it normally with the pipe you can begin it with section include exclude or begin you have to play around with those to, to figure out the input and output that you want, but that's always an option. On the right hand side, show IP int brief, you could do it so you only include the up interfaces. You're going to have to get used to playing with the pipes so that you can see how you'd like. Command history, you could always hit the up arrow to see the command history. It will cycle through the last 10 commands that you've typed in. 
Let's go hop into routing switching functions, the encapsulation and decapsulation. On our each end node on the NPCs, you go through all seven layers. But between each hop, we are only going through the bits, frames, and package so we can get the layer 3 IP address before we recapsulate it and send it back over. And each route, each router, will only look at the first three layers, the physical, data link, and network layers. Because we want to look at the IP address and the MAC address. That's it. So how do we send a packet? So conceptually what's happening is from PC1, it's the protocol is going, okay, I need to access PC2. It's not on my LAN. I need to encapsulate it and send it to my default gateway. Keeping in mind, the default gateway is the router on the LAN. So it will forward it to the FA0-0 interface or the MAC address 00-10. It will forward it to the router. The router will then change the MAC address to 00 -20, and it will forward it to the next router because it will look through its routing table and it knows it needs to go to 192.168.4.10 so it will go down here 192.168.4 network it's two hops away and the next hop is 192.168.2.2 .2. and that's going to be the exiting interface and so it will send it out that interface. Once it sends it out that interface, R2 will get it. R2's uh, IP address, it will be re being received on the 192.168.2.2 address. It will look at it, it will know, oh, I need to send it out because the destination address is still 192.168.4.10 address. So go through its, its list. Oh, I need to send it out. Serial 0 slash 0 interface to that IP address. The source IP address is, and the destination IP address is remaining the same, but the MAC addresses are changing. Here I'll send it out the serial interface R3. R3 will get it and it will say, oh, my ARP table tells me that PC2 is this MAC address. So it will be received on serial 0 slash 0 slash 0 interface and it will forward it out the FA 0 slash 0 interface to the appropriate MAC address, thus being delivered. And then for a response, It'll do the same process, except this will have the source address, this will have the destination address, it'll transverse the network backwards. So routing decisions. Packet arrives on an interface. The router will search the routing table for a match. If it doesn't have a match, does the IP destination IP address match a subnet of a directly connected uh, interface? Yes or no. If it's not directly connected, then it'll move to remote network. If it's not directly connected or remote network, is there a gateway of last resort available? If there is no gateway, if there's if there is no match directly connected or remote, and there is no gateway, it'll drop the packet. If there is a match to the directly connected interface, it'll check its ARP cache or to the local uh, network. If there is no directly connected, but there is a remote, it will encapsulate the frame and forward it out the exit interface to the next hop. If that is not the case, if it's not directly connected and there is no remote network, is there a gateway of last resort? If yes, it will encapsulate the frame and forward it out of the interface to the next hop. And that is the basic for routing decision. So in general, that is our routing decision table. 
So what are their best paths? How does that work? So the best path is selected by a routing protocol based on the value or metric it uses to determine the distance to reach a network. Right now, from point A to point B, how do we get there? And we use that based off of different values and metrics to, uh, to see what it's going to cost. A metric is a value used to measure the distance to a given network, while best path to a network is the path the lowest metric. Metrics and values can be different. Dynamic routing protocols use their own rules and metrics to build and update routing tables. For example, RIP, Routing Information Protocol, uses hop count. How many different paths, how many hops between A and B is their a metric? While OSPF, or Open Shortest Path First, cost based on cumulative bandwidth from the source to destination. So OSPF looks at the sum of the bandwidth between each target. Third, EIGRP, Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, looks at bandwidth, delay, load, and reliability. So there are different ways to look at this. Load balance. Load balancing is when a router has two or more paths to a destination with equal metrics. You can actually then balance between the two. Administrative distance. This is one metric used. This is a slide you want to know. The administrative distance for a static route is one. For interior gateway, for interior, uh, internal BGP, the AD is 200. For interior gateway routing protocol, it's 100. So you do want to know the administrative distances because this is one metric that is used. All right, so moving on to the routing cable. A routing cable is a file stored in RAM that contains all routes, directly connected, remote, and networks or next hop associations. So the routing cable shows all of the uh, networks that it knows. Routing cable sources, you can do this by doing show IP route. It will look at the local route, directly connected routes, any static routes that are manually programmed, and any learned dynamically routes. So if we type show IP route, here it is again. Here we have one route learned by the code D. So that's learned via EIGRP and that is 10.1.1.0 the slash 24. Here is the administrative distance and it is learned via that location. So it has been learned from router 2's outside interface. It has been learned via EIGRP. So the different entries mean different things. First, D. This is the code identifies how the network was learned. Next, identifies the destination network. Next, identifies the administrative distance or the trustworthiness of the route source. Next, identifies the metric to reach the remote network. Next, it is identifies the next hop to reach the remote network. This guy right here identifies the amount of elapsed time since the network was discovered. That may or may not always show. Lastly, identifies the outgoing interface to the route to, the, to reach the destination. So this is how it learned. That is the destination network, the metric, the total cost, the next hop, the time it uh, has learned, and the interface. That's important to know so that we can decode it later. So let's look at our directly connected 
Routing protocols. C. Identifies how the network was learned. Directly connected. L. Is also directly connected. Though L is a link local, So that's going to be a one-to-one -one address that will probably be its own interface. So here we have, yeah, 192.168.10.1 is its own interface. So that's going to be the, a local interface. Next is going to be identifying the destination, how it is connected, directly connected, and the interface that it needed to be sent to. Directly connected examples show IP route and then they here they happen to do a pipe and begin with gateway. So they're looking at just directly connected and link local routes. This is for IPv4. For IPv6 same thing, except they're going to be using IPv6 addresses. Static route. So a static route is a route that you manually put in. They are defined explicitly. Static routes must be manually updated. Though you can have some better security here. And how you do it is you type in the command IP route the source and the destination. So example IP route with any IP address, any subnet, send to that can either be an interface or destination. Here it will be a, an interface so it means it will send any address with any information any subnet out serial 000 interface. On R2, it will probably have the same thing out its interface. That way, all information that's not here locally will be sent to R2. And on this network, anything that's sent to R2 that's not locally it will be sent to R1. It will be a gateway of last resort because it's, an, it's a dedicated, statically assigned route. That's why you'll get S. IPv6, same thing, except here you don't have to use zeros. You can just use colon colon with a slash zero and you give it the interface to send to. So let's go ahead and move on to our dynamic routing. Dynamic routing are routes used by a router to share information about the reachability and status of remote networks. Not having to manually assign them. When you set up routing protocols, they will discover and talk to one another and update one another. For example, R1 knows about these three networks. R2 knows about these three networks. R2 can share about the networks it knows. It will go, I know these three networks. And it will send that to R1. R1 will also share the three networks it knows. 192.168.10, 192.168.11, and 209.165.200.224 they will share the networks that they know that way if there's a change if this network goes down R1 will share that information with R2 so what are the primary routing protocols EIGRP OSPF RIP is 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 still there but not very common. The more important one that is not here is Border Gateway Protocol or BGP. 
And here, again, they don't have the codes, but these are going to be learned via it's the code D, which we already know is EGRP. C is for directly connected. L is for link local. That way we can slowly start reading through this. What are the IPv6 versions of those protocols? RIP NG, next generation. OSPF, version 3. EIGRP for IPv6. And MP BGP4. Those are the routing protocols that will route IPv6. Still very similar to the IPv4 versions, but this is the new version. Again, you can do a show IPv6 route, and you can do the programming and the route tables for the IPv6 addresses. That's actually it for this chapter. There's a lot of material here, so let me know if you guys have questions. I want to thank you guys. I hope you guys have a great day. Bye.